Um, hello and welcome to MedCon Day 3. Um, we're going to kick off with uh, Paddy Rose from um, uh, Pat, uh, Pan Am Med Games. Uh, Paddy is the treasurer uh, at that group um, and in this um, talk today, he's going to talk about um, porting an uh, in-person game to an online setting. Um, so over to you, Paddy. All right, thank you very much. So as I say, if there's any port in a storm, uh, about porting mega games, to, uh, in-person ones to an online setting. Uh, so a very, very quick uh, bit of things about who I am, so if you don't know me. So as Chris says, I'm the treasurer for Penai Mega Games uh, as of January. So I'm quite quite new to that, that role. Um, in my real life job, I am a web developer. I work in a recruitment system for the NHS. Uh, and as a side thing, I'm a focusing on a Kaylee caller. In a normal year, I would go to about 30 or 40 weddings of people who I don't know and teach them how to do folk dancing. Uh, on a normal evening, but of course, it's been COVID, so that's something that I have not been doing. Um, and, and like the reason why I'm giving this talk is a, a game I have called Running Hot. So this was a pre-cyberpunk mega game which I wrote for the 2020 Nationals, uh, which is a a student convention type thing um, where they basically have a whole weekend. One of the universities hosts it. They have various tracks. Uh, it's primarily tabletop focused. And Sheffield's hosting it, which is where I'm, I live in the university I went to. And I said, well, I could run a mega game for you. And they said, yes, which meant I have to write one. Uh, so I wrote this one for their Cyberpunk theme. And then I pitched it to Penheim Mega Games for their 2020 games calendar. And then, you know, COVID happened. But it was fine. Uh, so I ported it to be run online. Uh, it used a Discord and Google Sheets and Roll20 for OMGCon, uh, which was the online convention set up by the uh, Mega Game Coalition. And we did successfully run it in the 2020 calendar, uh, the same date we were planning on running it in person. Um, I also had like a small bot to handle posting card stuff because I'm a tech geek and it's what I do. So the, the main reason I wanted to do this seminar was that I think that there is some reticence and some uncertainty about whether it's worth people porting games online. Um, I think that it is really worth people porting games um, for a couple of reasons. The main one is that there is a massive audience. I think we've seen that in pretty much every game that someone has run. Uh, tickets have tended to sell out within an hour uh, in some cases um, for running hot because I was scared of it running, of it falling out too quickly. I did end up um, like reserving some tickets so that we could people do it. Uh, from an economic standpoint as well, they are a lot cheaper. Um, They've that f certainly for for me. I think I calculated that to play a Mega Game Makers game for me down to Sheffield, from going down to London from Sheffield, it would probably cost me somewhere in the region of like two hundred quid just to cover accommodation and travel and all that sort of stuff. And the cost of me playing an online game is basically nothing. And they're also a lot cheaper to run. You don't have your venue costs. You don't have as much component costs or anything like that. Um, me and Andrew, I think, are unique in the uh, mega game design world because our first online mega games and our first runs of them didn't lose us money. So we're, we're quite rare in that. Um, but the main thing is that online games still give players the same opportunities in play that an in-person game does. Um, I was, I think we were all kind of unsure about whether mega games could work online, uh, but I certainly can tell you that I am still exhausted after running uh, Den of Wolves yesterday. I'm still exhausted from helping run as that commands and I was exhausted after that. And it was that happy exhaustion that you get after an online mega game. So I think it's, I, I think it's something that is worth considering. So some very, very quick background. I'm just going to talk about two online mega games, two versions of Den of Wolves, because I think those are the, the main uh, standard bearers for this thing. So what I've affectionately called Swede Den of Wolves, so Johanna Nicholas from Gothenburg Mega Games, they ran Den of Wolves last April, which as far as I'm aware is the first online mega game. I've given this presentation to like five people and no one has corrected me on that yet. So I'm calling that gospel. Um, so they just had a Discord server for everyone to chat to each other. They had Google Sheets for the sh uh, ships to talk to each other. And they had a Roll20 interface for the battle map. Uh, in that first run, all the resource movement and all the complicated things was handled exclusively by control. Uh, and in the second one, they used uh, some Google Forms. Uh, by resource movement here, I mean, uh, if you haven't played Den of Wolves, you have the idea that each ship's got some food or water and you need to distribute that across the fleet. 
which is handled by a shuttle. So if you wanted to do something uh, in the fleet, then you need to speak to control or on the second one, you use Google Form. Um, Formula Hell abounded for the Google Form one. Uh, if you haven't yet seen this glorious um, formula that they used for this, this is a um, uh, the formula that they used to work out how much resources each ship had or something like that. I didn't really understand what it was. I recommend not looking at it lest you lose your brains. Um, and then the flip side is you have Splinter Reality. So Kurt LaRue, who ran Denables yesterday, uh, he ran his first one at for Tabletopia, I think, or some online, some convention that was losing uh, was losing the, the funding because they had to cancel all the, their in-person uh, section. Um, they had the custom interface. So it has a fancy web interface, which if you've not seen, there'll be some pictures of in a second, which allowed you to move your resources around a lot more easily than inside you were using a Google form. And it had a whole bunch of fancy Discord iterations as well. Um, so yeah, if you haven't seen it before, uh, this is the 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 Aegis. Um, so you can see that it's got a timer at the top right, which tells you which phase you're in, which uh, turn you're in. There's got all the various stations inside the Aegis. You can just pick someone up, you can drag them across to whatever station it is. It tells you whether they're damaged. Um, because I've taken the screenshot when I was controlled for it, you can see that I've got a whole bunch of edit things. So I've got an awful lot of power. So if I need to, if I need to undo uh, a bad roll or something, I can just say actually that food synthesizer wasn't damaged in the last wolf attack because of whatever, or I can give them more resources as, as time allows. So you might look at those two things and go, oh, I'm hang on, what what is it that I should aim for? And it's worth mentioning that those two examples are very much the two extremes of the process. Um, Gottenberg were the first people to do an online game. So of course there was always gonna be some strange teething issues. Um, and Kurt could also build on, on that. Uh, he had a good tech team and Denevals is quite a light game as it is anyway. So it was a lot easier to do a fancier interface for it. Where it is that you end up will almost certainly be somewhere in the middle. Um, and where you aim for is gonna entirely depend on what skills you, you have, you yourself have, and also what skills you can acquire from the rest of your control team and your game runner team. Uh, so if, you, if your team or no one inside your team has any development skills, then obviously trying to build your own web tool is a stupid idea. But on the flip side, if you're actually not that particularly comfortable with spreadsheets or anything like that, having the crazy interlinked spreadsheets that they had for Gottenberg or in, we've seen in some other games, that's also not necessarily a good idea. Um, just remember that running and designing mega games is already an incredible feat of effort and perseverance. So I think that you should port it off, but I also think that you should you should make sure that you're not trying to do do too much. Um, I think we'd, we'd certainly rather see more more games than people start it and then go this this I can't hack this and end up having to give up. So uh, I also want to talk about how I break down a game. So this is basically how, sort of how I approach running hot, and I'll go through running hot uh, in a bit more depth afterwards. So there's kind of like two steps that I, I took for it, which might be very similar to the steps that you take for the rest of the um, your actual design process. Um, I don't know idea what my design process is. Um, I just remember writing a lot of my rule book while I was drinking wine. So obviously don't take my word for it by designing things, but break down your game work out what your sub games, what mechanics do people interact with and work out the components. Um, for here, when I say sub games, um, I'm basically mean like, what are your mechanical games that people are playing? So if you have a map game, what is your map game? If you have some sort of research game, that's that's the thing. Your components are the actual things that someone would pick up and um, things. So ask yourselves those questions. And once you've got those questions, you've got some other stuff that you should think about. When it comes to your sub games, the things that you should be aware of is that things that are incredibly easy and fast to do in person are very difficult and slow to do online. Um, if you if you just think about it in your head, like if you had to play a card and thing, it's a very simple action for you to do. You just take the card out of your hand and you just play it. Whereas online, you have to find your hand wherever it is on your interface. You've got to drag it and move it across. And just that, those few seconds slow down your game an awful lot. Uh, the inverse is also true. There are some things which are just fast to do, which is basically any calculations that you need to do. If you have to do a calculation and you can just get a computer to do it for you, whereas in person, someone might need to grab a pen and paper, which is you know, 
slower as well. So when you're looking at your sub games, things that you should consider, is your game timed? Um, most game games have got some timing element to them, but just just think about like what, how long you're expecting someone to take to take a certain game. So when it comes to this, if they've got to pick and choose a card, as I say, that's going to take longer than you think, and those little time things add up. Certainly, moving units is slower because it takes longer to do that with the drag and drop interface. Um, so when you're just thinking about it in your head, just give more time than you think. Uh, we found at Running Hot that the facility uh, run game, uh, I timed that as 10 minutes in person, and then it just continued to overrun in every single game. So we gave it 15, and then it continued to still overrun. So a lot of the times, just feel free to just add an extra 10 minutes or double it, whatever makes more sense for your, your game. Um, also, think about what interactions your game has, and that can be at a interplayer level and also interact your games, your sub games, how it interacts with the rest of your mega game as it is. So are your players reacting to each other? Um, and is that reaction real time? Uh, so that reaction could be, you have come and attacked my, um, you, you've come and sent a whole bunch of tanks into Italy. Uh, what's my reaction? Am I bringing in some of the units from France or whatever? Don't I don't understand what this game is. Don't ask geography questions. Do I need to react to that like straight away? Is there a turn structure or something that I need to do, need to do with? Um, as I said before, things take longer. And certainly for sort of asynchronous things, you have to remember that they're going to have to take time for them to notice that and then also react on top of it. So when it comes to your timings, again, just think about that. But also worry about how your game interacts with the rest of it. Most sub games should interact with the rest of your game at some level. Um, but what are the results of your sub game? How does it feed into the rest of your game? And do you need to update a player board or something like that? Do you need to update some global state? So depending on the systems you have in space, you also need to build in time for those resolutions to complete. You probably already include that mentally because you know that control has to go and do something or a player has to go do something but just remember things take longer so give more time for that to happen when it looks to components um again transferring components between players is really easy in a physical game you just give them the the token online you have a whole bunch of other concerns to worry about so think about what sort of ownership of resources does a player need um, I, I, I've, I've said this and it is just a just about but in a physical game you can just about get away with like during your team time or whatever your equivalent is control can go around and hand out the resources and they will just do it uh, if you try and do that online everything's going to slow down and the game's going to go to a crawl and your team time will go too long and you'll not get as much game out of it and it's not actually an interesting time for players just to wait for control to give, it, give stuff um, we certainly found that again in, in Running Hot that there was just one person whose job it was to do that sort of thing and they just they got completely overwhelmed and it slowed down the game and it wasn't their fault it was because they had to do too much stuff in too little time my my guiding principle for this is if you can just let your players own the resources um i'm i'm quite trustworthy of, of players and i'll talk about this a bit more but i think you there are some things that you should just let the players handle instead because they will be it's much easier to have 40 people do one thing as opposed to two people do 40 things for everyone. Also wonder about what components you need to make on the fly in response to player actions because they're doing a wizard wheeze or something like that. Um, again, in person, you could just write that on a piece of paper and hand it to a player. I think we've all seen various screenshots of um, Matt Bambridge's various uh, Swedish bank accounts, not Swedish bank accounts, uh, Switzerland bank accounts. So that sort of thing that you could just do. It's a lot harder to do that uh, online. And however you're doing this, it, it needs to feed into how you're tracking your other components. So that's just something to, to consider when you're looking at your tech stacks. And again, like how you're going to answer this problem is going to depend on how you choose to port the rest of your game. But my, my guiding principle, again, make it a player's problem. Let them, them handle it. They, they can just keep track of it on a piece of paper or a note in some of the other systems that you're using. You don't have to be, you don't have to think about it too hard. So I recommend not. Uh, and then once you've once you've looked at that, those are the main questions I think. Are, and there will obviously be more that you come for it. 
then you just need to work out what it is that you're going to use to run the game itself. So how are you handling your communication between your players? Uh, how are you letting them talk to each other? How are you handling the resources, so the actual components that they're touching? So uh, that's what I mean by that. And how are you handling your sub-games? What tech stacks are you going to use about that? When it comes to communication, um, the core of any mega game experience is communication, and anyone telling you otherwise, I believe, is lying to you. There, even if you are a military player, you are spending a lot of time talking to someone else and convincing them not to attack you or similar. So basically, you need to be spending time with that. So when you're looking at your tools, the most important thing you need to look at is to make sure that it is as easy as possible for someone to start com a communication channel with someone else, however you like to. Um, it needs to be easy to, to do it. If they have to press 20 buttons to join a conversation, it's going to be annoying and it's going to slow down the, your game. And people will just stop doing it. They'll only do the things that are easy for them to do. Um, whatever it is you're doing, just look for tools that will start a conversation with a single click. But also bear in mind that only one conversation can happen at once. Uh, in person, it's as easy to just step aside and talk in hushed tones to have a private conversation with someone at your table. And online, you're going to need to provide those spaces. So I think the standard most people have settled around has been Discord, um, which hopefully you're all aware of, seeing as the Megacon Discord exists, and a lot of the games we're, we're playing today have been one over Discord, which is great. It's free. Um, I find the user interface fairly intuitive. Um, I'm aware that I'm a young millennial, so uh, your your uh, mileage may vary, but I think that a lot of people kind of understand if I need to go and talk to someone, I click the voice channel where I'm at. If I need to chat to someone in text, I can just click that button. Um, it's fairly easy, I found. Um, but again, I am a young millennial who works in the work as a web developer. I find it quite easy to set up the channels, the roles and positions. So if you don't know what those are, the channels are the, the places where people can talk. So your voice channels or your text channels, the roles are what sort of permissions that people can have. So you can set up a channel so that only people who are part of Italy can go and speak to them, and what which means the French players can't go in. You can set up a thing for the only people on the council, they can get inside and they can see the stuff inside there. You can also have text channels for asynchronous communication as well, which is actually one of the benefits for an online game. Um, just the fact that you can be talking to someone while sharing that, like basically just texting the rest of your team and telling them these fun things are happening. That's quite an important uh, and useful tool. Um, there's also a wide array of existing bots. So you'll have seen in the Megacon Discord, there's the Apollo bot, which is giving events, which is probably not as useful for your game, but there's timer bots, there's things of converting time zones, because I say there's a worldwide audience. And my, my guiding principle is that time zones suck. So just having something handle conversions for you is great. There are a couple of problems with Discord um, that we've come across. It's quite easy to have what we call channel bloat. Uh, running hot, I think I count, it has about 40 channels at the beginning of the game, and then more are created as the game goes on. Den of Wolves has, I think, maybe in the region of 50. That's a lot of things. <clears throat> and you can it can be quite overwhelming as well with your notifications, especially if you're on the control team where you can see everything. Um, so just be bear those in mind. The other option that I've seen so far has just been Gather, uh, Gather Town, which is what we used for Under Pressure. I, I wrote these slides before I had the chance to really play with it, so they're, they're a bit light, but I'll talk about it. So if you haven't seen Gather, you have like a little avatar that you move around. Uh, if you have seen Have a Hotel or something like that, it's basically that sort of thing. And then when you get close to someone else, it starts up a, a voice channel with just you two. So it sort of matches the... Uh, the in-person experience because you are, when you get close to someone, you can hear them talk. Uh, you can do some fancy maps things. So under pressure, um, I sadly don't have any screenshots of it, but you can have uh, the entire, like an actual submarine. So it's like they are inside a submarine, uh, which in, you couldn't do easily do that in a venue. You couldn't have a really cramped experience in a venue because everyone would hate it because you've got to actually let people have room to move. Um, so the, the fact that they can make this more cramped space um, is a real positive. Cons, so the the pricing on this is, is strange. The Gather is supposed to be used for conference 
conferences so you could just have an online conference and people can go to various talks and, and hear about that. Uh, what I saw is it was $1 per user for two hours. I don't know if that matches. Um, there might be other pricing tiers uh, if you're interested in going and um, happens more. There are also a couple of weird technical issues. It's a fairly new platform and what it's trying to do is actually quite difficult. Um, it's to keep track and open up voice channels and technical channels as things go. Um, but the main sticking point, I think for me, is it's a lot harder to just talk to control. Um, we have all been in games where we need to talk to control so somewhat privately because we're, provide we're planning some nonsense and it's a slightly harder to do that. Um, the way they got around it for the under pressure play test was that they just also had some Discord channels that you could just go into those, mute self and gather and talk in Discord, which is a workaround, but obviously it's not amazing. When it comes to your player resources, so the components that people are playing with, uh, there are a lot more options that we've we've seen. So there's Google Sheets, there's Miro or any of the whiteboarding tools, or there is your custom interfaces. Uh, Google Sheets, uh, is John in this thing? Because hopefully it's too early for the for him to shout at me for this. Um, so Google Sheets, I am a big fan of. I think it is actually a really useful tool, um, even though John from uh, West Coast Games violently disagrees. Um, it is, it's free. It's incredibly unlikely that it's going to fall over. Um, I I've, haven't yet seen Google go down in the world, and I don't think we will probably see that in our lifetime. Uh, you can also do a lot of interlinked data quite easily, which is incredibly useful just so you can keep track of where everything is. Um, Cons wise, spreadsheets are awful. Um, the actual experience of interacting with them is is not fun. Um, if it ends up breaking, if something goes wrong, then it will probably break hard and your entire game is, is screwed. A lot of that's true for a lot of other um, things, but especially if you're using the automation tools in Google Sheets, if that goes wrong, then a lot of things will go wrong. As I say, it can be incredibly overwhelming. I I think I've not seen yet a game where someone is using spreadsheets where someone hasn't felt overwhelmed at some point. And it's not that they're they're overwhelmed because of the game itself, they're overwhelmed because of the interface. If you're planning on using Google Sheets, just use it for tracking incredibly simple data. Um, use it for the amount of money that a faction has, use it for the, their renown or anything else like that. Don't use it for a big long list of action cards. Don't use it for your army lists and where they are. If it's a simple number, go for it. Uh, if you're planning on doing more complicated things, I, I really recommend looking elsewhere. It's it's a spreadsheet. It's supposed to be used for, for spreadsheety things like numbers. If you're trying to make it do things it won't do, you're A, gonna have to spend the time making it do that. And you also have to spend the time explaining that to people. And I've not yet seen a good explanation of those things. Some tips for a happy control since I've run a couple of games now using Google Sheets. Uh, have a primary control sheet that's just referenced by all your player sheets so you can deal with it. For the things, the main thing is you can just see at a glance how all your players are doing. Uh, in person, you'd have to go around and check all the tables and see that actually everyone has got no morale and you need to kind of give some, some helpful nudges or you can't see that everyone is doing too well so you need to give them more problems to deal with. It makes it a lot easier to change things that only control should be changing or seeing. Um, running a hot has a couple of global things that only we get to make the decisions on. Uh, players can argue with us as much as they like, but it's our final say. Uh, so, and if you aren't aware of it, there is the import range function. It is your, your friend for those sorts of things. But the main thing to just make sure you are have a happy time is just know what Google Sheets can do and what it shouldn't do. Um, things like trying to trade resources resources automatically between your different factions it's it's difficult and error prone i spent three or four hours trying to set it up for running hot and i just came to the conclusion that there was always going to be some bug with it and it was easy just to let the players deal with it instead um just let your players run your sheets that's that's my if you do take, take anything else away from from this when it comes to your porting decisions just getting your players to run stuff for themselves is where it comes from um, but main thing is try and give people access to your spreadsheets or something like that before the game. 
we it's a lot easier to do that. You can't like package your mega game and send it out to all your players before a game. You can sort of do that online. The the main barrier to your game is going to be the interfaces that people use. It's not it's not really an issue to give them access to that thing as long as you don't give them access to your entire game so they can solve it. Like give them the access to their spreadsheet so they can they can sort of understand, they can see how they should be changing it. So your other options, the Miro. Um, so this thing is basically just a whiteboarding app, which makes it really great for simulating like a physical player board, um, which makes it a lot more intuitive for players to interact with. It looks like something they would see at a physical game, which makes it slightly easier for them to understand. Uh, we used it for um, as that commands and just like having like little trackers that if it was a uh, normal game, you have like a poker check or something, you could just move across. Uh, makes it a lot easier for people to understand what it is that they're doing. And I think it probably makes it a lot easier to port. If you have some existing components that you've used for a game, you can just uh, you can just take the files, upload them to Miro, and there you go, you're done. Conwise, uh, it's a trivial amount of money, but it's just worth mentioning that it does cost um, about $8 a month from what I could see. There is a free option, which you could use while you're just getting things set up, um, but you will need to pay for it just so that you can have all the anonymous access that you need. Um, it's also quite difficult to share things from Miro around the game if you're not sharing it inside the same board. Um, I think we've seen that happen in the first run of Watch the Skies Lockdown. Just what the things that the, the scientists did, it was slightly harder to get that to feed into the rest of the game. Uh, and also, it's a whiteboarding app. It's not clever. It's quite dumb. There is absolutely no automation whatsoever. So just be aware of that. Um, so I would say if you're going to use Miro, you should try and use it for private things that change quite simply. So again, money or any other trackers like that, I think they're, they're great for that. Um, don't use it for anything where there is a complicated formula. Um, so they, oh, if you get five resources, then it becomes two wood and then one sheep or whatever. Um, players have to pass that. And again, it's online. They're going to have to A, pass that and then work out how to do it inside Miro. Um, and I'd say don't use it for tradable components, but I, I say that you can get around things. You can just take a screenshot and share it and then upload it to a different board, but that will take you time. And if you don't need that sort of thing, then try and avoid it. Um, Miro is not the only whiteboard app. If you're, if you don't get on with it, there's Klaxoon, there's Concept Board, there's Moral, there's probably infinitely more. Uh, probably just Google the idea of a whiteboard app and just see what works for you. Um, I have no idea about those those things. Uh, I've not seen them used yet in a game. I haven't had the chance to control a game with them. So I don't know which ones are better, if any of them are better. Um, I don't know much about costs. So if you're interested, have a look. For when it comes to the other things, your final option is just to do a custom build. So build your own interface. So this is better. <laughs> the world is your oyster. You can make it as good as you as you want it to be. You can make it as good as you need it to be. You can enforce some rules. So with the Den of Wolves interface, when things are as a wolf attack, it blocks you from uh, activating uh, stations. It blocks you from moving people around because that's the thing you're not allowed to do by the game rules. The problem is that it's not an easy task. Um, you have a lot more concerns about your site falling over because you're going to have 40, 50 people accessing at once and all doing their shenanigans. And it requires a certain set of skills and resources that are a lot rarer than in the community. I think there is a uh, as a guiding thing of a lot of there being nerdy types of people inside the mega game community, but I don't think there is a massive collection of people who are uh, web developers. When that slide came up, you will have already known whether this is something that you could do, whether you got the skills uh, or whether it's something that you can do. But there is a, a slight other option, even if you if you aren't aware of it. There's something called Project Nexus. So this is being built by John and Scott over at West Coast Mega Games. Um, it has had some some runs. It's been used to run Afterlife, which is a play by email mega game uh, by Stuart. Um, and they're building on top of that for some other um, things. And it basically will handle a lot of your resources. It will handle handle your player resources. It can handle some of your rules on top of things. Uh, is that uh, it is Patreon funded. Um, so if you are interested, feel free to, to throw them some money. But 
uh, one of the main things I think that John and Scott are really interested in making sure that this is a tool that a lot of people can use. So if you are interested in running it, they will speak speak to them. Um, they can tell you what what information that they would need. Uh, I know that they're certainly looking for people to help them with uh, user uh, experience design and all sort of things. So feel free to, if you have those skills, uh, feel free to speak to them. I'm not going to go too much in detail with it because I've not yet had the chance to interact with Nexus, but it is. I'm I'm quite excited to see it run. I know that I'm planning on uh, porting Running Hot to use it just so that it can get the chance to be to run an actual game. But um, Nexus is also they were. It was originally going to be designed to help with in-person games as well. So I think that you might see more of Nexus as time goes on. When it comes to handling your sub games, your actual mechanical uh, strength bits. Um, I think that there are a lot less options. You've got Roll20, you've got Miro, uh, or the whiteboarding stuff again, and you've got your custom builds again. Um, Roll20, uh, if you haven't heard of it, is a um, app that's designed to help you run like role-playing games, primarily built for certainly like quite map-heavy um, D&D games, that sort, that sort of thing, which actually makes it really, really great for maps. Every time I've seen it used for a map game, it's been, it's it's worked really well, I think, for it. Uh, it's also got supports for cards, if you have like sort of private cards or something like that, that thing that people play with. It's got good support for those sorts of things. And you can set up macros so that if if you have a rule that your tanks should roll 5d8s and they should hit on sixes, but your infantry roll 1d3 or whatever, um, you can just make it so there's a button that people can press and it will do, do that for you so you don't have to worry about them doing the wrong thing. Cons, it is designed for running D&D sessions and other tabletop uh, and kind of works quite well at about six, but then as soon as you throw more people at it, it can struggle. Uh, so if you are if you have a map game with 40 players involved in it, um, it, might not, it might not be happy with you. Uh, if you have multiple maps as well, moving players between them is, is difficult because they have to leave the game that they're in and join another one. Uh, Miro wise, so you can use Miro for map games, uh, basically just upload the map to it, upload the, the tokens and just move them around inside that. Um, it is difficult to use for cards or anything which needs to remain, remain private, so possibly don't use it for that. And again, custom stuff, it's exactly the same as before. Uh, you already know this is an option, you already know whether it's something you can do. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes just talking through like how running hot use those things. So running hot, as I said, uh, Discord for player communication, Google Sheets for the bulk of the of the game, um, for all the, tracking the player resources, and then there's rolled, a bit of a Roll20 interface, which I'll go through very quickly. Um, timeline wise, in case this is something you're doing, I think I ended up making the decision that we weren't doing an in-person game uh, somewhere around the mid-June, and then I finished the main port by the end of July. This wasn't like just spending time on it, um, I think we had, I got some something together quite quickly within a week and a half that I play tested with Jerry and Daniel. And then we worked on it a bit more and then did a couple of play tests um, after that. There's been some minor change between the runs. So this is the uh, pictures from the, the latest games. So when it comes to Discord, we have it set up so that you've got a public text channel so people can get the, their attention. Uh, a private text channel so that teams can plan and then control can get in touch with them. And then there are four public voice channels for public communication, because as I say, you can only have one conversation happening at once. So just giving them the space to have it. And then there's a private one if your team needs to have some private chats. That That is a lot. Um, I think I've come to the conclusion that because every faction has this, this thing, I'm probably going to lower it down to three, uh, just so that the scroll wheel doesn't get used as much. Um, each of the different sub games, they've got their own channels. So the council, for example, has got a text channel for voting and for control to shout at people to come and join the game or give them information about that. Um, and then there's voice channels while they play the game. The council, again, has got some tie channels because you can only have one conversation happening at once and there's always some level of diplomacy inside a council game. Uh, Google Sheets. Um, I have to thank Dan White from Empty Set for a lot of this. So what we have here is the, the control thing, uh, not the control, the cooperation spreadsheet. So there is 
a whole bunch of information for them to see it, which is again hard to take in at a glance. Uh, I'm not going to go through it in a lot of depth because it's quite um, you know heavy on what happens inside of Running Hot. But like things that are kind of important is that there's a whole bunch of automatic things that tell you how much you've got of each resources at the top. You have a ledger at the side, which basically tells you what it is that you spent your money on, uh, which was useful for the corporations because it kind of fit the thematic theme of them having to have an audit trail or something like that. Um, they had, the corporations also had like a, a facility spreadsheet, which told them what they are. So it had things like telling them, oh, here are the things that are inside your spreadsheet. Here's how much money you're using to defend it. They could fill out, they could put the physical protection cards and the cyber protection cards. Um, inside it, which was uh, a lot easier than that. But again, like I, I'm, this is this is the best thing that I could do inside Google Sheets. I I'm, I really kind of hate the way that this is this is done in the, the real world. Uh, it's not intuitive for people to use, but it's the best thing that, that we have. It's the only it's the bit of the of the interface that I think is the weakest. Um, so the runners themselves, they kind of have a very similar uh, setup. They don't have as much complicated things happening. They've got some stats that corporations don't. Again, they've got a ledger at the side because it turns out just letting people know what they've spent their money on is is very useful. Uh, so the Roll20 interface, it's a uh, research game for the quick overview is that each player's got their own little private deck full of cards they use to make things. And there's also a public deck for them to draw from. So they just uh, handle that inside there. It took me long the longest thing to set up was the roll 20 thing because uploading a load of cards took a long time uh, it's not an, an easy task to do but it's easy enough to do um it's it's not hard it just was painful um because you had to do it card by card um and i just let the players track their scoring manually because roll 20 didn't doesn't know much about cards or images like that so it was just easy to let them handle that So some very brief closing thoughts. Um, playtesting, hopefully we all agree that playtesting is a good idea, but it's more, it's as important or if not more than a physical game. Um, you've got some other concerns to worry about. Even if your game is proven, you have to worry about these sorts of things. So test your interfaces. Can people who haven't seen it, haven't been involved in building it, can they understand how to use them? Will they hold up to lots of people touching it? I know that it's hard to do that, in a uh, thing because if you're if you're basically doing a play test to scale then you're basically doing your full game but it's in just test that sort of thing get as many people as you can to use it in a play test mainly make sure that things people can do things as quickly as the game needs them to do running hot's research game had to change because it just couldn't happen fast enough for the time slot that they had which meant that their their economies couldn't grow to the level that they needed it to trust your players be Pragmatic, not lazy about your tools. Spend several hours locking down everything so that people can't touch anything, or just let them let them trust it. You would trust a player at a physical game. You wouldn't worry about them stealing stuff from the control uh, stack. Um, people people don't tend tend to do that, and the people who do that, it's really obvious when they do. So don't worry about it. You're, most of the time, your tools will have some sort of audit log if you need to use it if you're worried about it. I just trust your players. That's, that's where I, I come down on it. When it comes to your training, be prepared to spend more time training your players and your control team. Um, if you can, record videos, talk through how to use the system. Running Hot, um, how basically there's a, a, a bit of software called OBS, which I basically just recorded my screen and talked through. Here is how you do the most mechanically complex part of the run. You go to this channel, you run this command, you then go to your spreadsheet. This is the information you need. Even if you can't record a video, write some explainers, step-by-step um, -step guides for how you should do things. Build more time into your game day to teach thing, people how to use things. We all will probably put a turn zero in our game day. Um, make your turn zero slightly longer. When it comes to that though, just give people access before your game starts so that they can, they can understand things. It helps cut down your training because your training can work under a slight assumption that they've seen what it is that they need to use. Until people see it, they won't fully understand it. People understand physical systems. They understand things that they can touch a lot more intuitively than they understand online ones. So help them out as much as you can. When you do this, however, don't let them solve the game in advance. 
Um, so you should show the interface and you should show a whole bunch of fake information, but don't show the entire game state, only show the things that they should see. If you, they wouldn't see it on turn one or turn two, don't show it to them. Um, it might be slightly more work for you, but it prevents the game being solved in advance. And, and finally, don't, don't feel obliged to work on this alone. Porting on a game is a project just like designing one is. Um, although, although a lot of designs kind of come, come from a single person, like the, the actual game day itself is tends to be the result of a, of a well, well run control team. Um, there is significant interest in keeping online games going post pandemic. There is a group called Omega, which is just in the process of getting set up to kind of keep games running, running both play by email and uh, one day events. So if you're interested in that thing, speak to me, I can get you in touch with those sorts of people. And don't be scared. It's not trivial, but designing a game isn't anyway. Um, it's not impossible. Um, as I say, break it down, work on it piece by piece. Your online game will end up looking different to your in-person game, and that is fine. Um, things that would work in person won't work online. Don't don't see that as a failure. See that as you you adapting to the place that you are. That is where I am. So, has anyone got any questions? Thank you, Patrick. That was really good. Um... Yeah, if anybody has had any questions, I know there's been a bit of chat going on, which I've been watching, but if you do have any questions, please pop it in the chat or into the Q&A panel, and I'll ask um, Patrick the, uh, the questions as they come up. The first one we've got is from Alex Beck. Um, is it perhaps not better to design a game from the ground up for the online space rather than trying to convert a design? I wonder um, if you can't provide a more tailored and interesting experience to the players if you do it that way. So, yes, um, your designing a game for just online play is probably going to be better than designing a game than, than porting a thing. Uh, my main idea here is that I think there are a lot of designs out there that people might want to just port online to have those, those sorts of things going. And whether, I, I think that if you design a game explicitly to use online systems, then you will end up, uh, you will end up with certainly a more in interesting, um, not necessarily more interesting game, you'll end up with a, a, a different game um if you if you want to do that then go ahead I, this is entirely based on the idea that i already have a game um and i'm thinking about porting it online here's here's some tips and tricks if if you want to start designing a game to be run online i think the so under pressure has pretty much been designed uh to be run online i know that they they were thinking about running it in person you also have john's and nubis heresy i think that was also like explicitly designed to take advantage of online tools so yeah i think that there is that they, those two things are are complementary. There is, there will still be the appetite for porting games that can't easily, people can't run on uh, in person uh, because of, say, a global pandemic. But also, like, it's it's quite nice to have uh, an online game. The American people are are nice and uh, are are very different, and it's actually quite nice to just see how their playstyle completely is radically different from the uh, us Brits. Yeah, for sure. Um, I went to um, Gen Con in 2019, I think it was. And yeah, I noticed that their playstyle was, was radically different to ours as well. But obviously, you know, it's going to kind of happen, isn't it? Kind of, they've watched the, the video that we all have and have a different culture growing up from that. So it's completely fair. Mm. Um, do you have any ideas for the next game you're going to run? Are you going to run it completely online or are you going to do sort of a, a hybrid as you've done with um, Running Hot, do you think? Uh, don't pass. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> So, like the next thing that I work on is I'm so I've got another run of running hot happening for for Pennine on uh, in May, and then my I'm putting running hot down for a while. I I don't know whether the next game idea will be in person or not. I know that I've got some I do want running hot to happen in person, but nationals got postponed to uh, next April because of some pandemic. So I'm going to have it run there so I can I can see that, and then I will decide whether it's. I ever want to be involved in running an in-person game ever again, um, running and designing one. So, I, I'm like one of the things that I didn't talk about was uh, hybrid stuff where you have some online and some in-person. And the reason why I've not talked about that is no one has yet done that. So, if someone wants to be the trendsetter, please feel free, and also please get in touch because I'd be quite interested in helping on that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that actually, because um, obviously before the pandemic 
there's the, not everybody, but the overall community view was, you know, technology to make game is bad, don't do it. Um, and there were, I, I don't really recall of any game that sort of introduced a lot of technology or even any technology other than, you know, physical components and what have you. Um, but do you think that uh, with the way we've all been living for the last year and once we do get back to going playing games, hopefully in the next few months, um, we'll see what happens. But do you think that people will start introducing technology? I, I hope they will. So what when you look at, at the tech stuff, so you you should always have a backup plan um, for what happens. So if you're doing a hybrid game, what happens if your technology falls over? What happens? Um, the people who are playing in person, they're probably fine, but the people who aren't on site, what what do you do with them? How do they how do they interact with that? So I think that what we will see, we will, what I hope to see is that uh, there will be a bunch of hybrid designs which go, if this breaks, if this link ends up breaking, then we have we can pivot quite quickly and uh, things will be fine. I think the controlling for that will end up being quite a lot. Um, you tend to need more control for online just because of it's harder to do things. Um, so Den of Wolves has run with a control team of about 10 and I think has been run, uh, I think what, two ten members of control or something ridiculous like that. I mean, granted one of those was John, so it doesn't really count, but it's you have got that sort of level of, um, of difference. So I would, I I'd like to see it, and again, if anyone is planning on doing it, getting get in touch. Um, it's I think it's make sure that if things go wrong, you have a backup plan. But I think everyone has that anyway. We everyone has a backup plan for their game breaking, hopefully. Yeah, it's critical, isn't it? Uh, I've got a, Becky, a question from Becky. Is it more important to build breaks and downtime into an online game? What about splitting games over in multiple days? For example, half half of it on Saturday and half of it on Sunday. I don't have any strong opinions on this. Um, I, it's harder to sit at a computer for eight hours than it is to stand in a hall running around like a madman because your body isn't designed to do that. So, having having breaks is is good. Um, there's I think there's a long conversation um, brewing in the community about whether breaks are a good idea or not um, having a having lunch break or something like that. So I don't know where we where things will, will stand. Um, I think that it's it's a useful tool for, for online just to give people things. Um, the runs of Running Hot that we had, um, the first two didn't have a break, um, which I think was okay, but I've also seen it run with a break and it was also fine. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Splitting stuff over multiple days, on the other hand, I think that you have to be careful of your momentum. Um, if when if you have a break of 30 minutes where you just tell everyone, log off, walk away from your computer, it's fine. But you can't tell everyone to log off and walk away for a whole evening and you have the same sort of problems with pre-gaming that you have. Uh, you, but you now have you now it like slightly in the middle of the game. The game has stopped. Everyone can just take a breath and sort of solve all their problems if they if they need to so it's i'm not sure is the is the is the short answer i, th I think breaks are a good idea for for online um if you're doing something particularly long but also i i think that not having one also works as well um it's your choice yeah fair enough uh jim commented that um from recent his recent experience um breaks are more important because of the cognitive overload um involved in obviously extended screen time of people looking at their monitors and what have you in a face-to-face -face, uh, game you can obviously go and grab a cup of tea and sort of stare at the window for a bit to avoid the mm -hmm. chaos but yeah um one from rob grayston do you think there's room for multimedia scripted events like videos and sound um akin to uh, media uh, a video game cutscene in, in online mega games uh, I think no, because a meg game is, if it's not coming from a player, what's the point? Um, you like, there's some little tiny things that you will always see. So you'll it will, you'll regularly see a press player uh, pull up the BBC News news jingle and include that as, at the beginning of their press broadcast. Uh, that's thing. But I think if you if you, as soon as you include a cutscene, control is deciding what's happening, and I don't think that's. I, I don't think that's valuable. I think that your it should come from your players. Um, even if the cutscene is is kind of like planned by the players, um, just let them act it out. Um, I think that's that's what that's what you do in, do in person. I think that's, that the same sort of uh, principle should apply. Um, control aren't there to decide what happens. Control are there to make sure that um, it, 
it doesn't go off the rails too hard. Yeah, that's, that's completely fair. Um, just going back to the whether or not a game should be run across two days or what have you, uh, Dave Bandy mentions when he asked a question on Facebook uh, a little while ago um, about obviously having a one day game or two half days um, if it's online, the vote was strongly for one day only. Um, but obviously that could change over time. We've been in this pandemic for a, for a year now. Um, you mentioned training and your, your control during the presentation. What, what kind of things would you, what kind of way would you recommend doing it? Sort of get them online like a week beforehand, show them the um, the actual way to, to run through things they can ask questions or do through videos through OBS? Uh, if you can go through your control thing in, in person, so for the empty set versions of Running Hot, um, Dan, who is an amazing project manager for these sorts of things, basically said, like, we're all going to sit in there and we're going to go through each of the mechanical bits. You're all going to play it. You can see how the players are meant to do things. You can understand things and ask questions. So you would hopefully have some sort of control briefing, but obviously it's hard to do that for an in-person thing if your control team is spread across the entirety of the UK. Um, if it's an online thing, everyone can just hop into a Discord and you can go through it uh, piece by piece and let them ask questions so they, they understand what's going on. So I, I would say do, for the for want of a better word, do it in person, by which I mean do it in an actual meeting where you're all on the call and going through it. Um, it's especially if you can all do it together so you can all, all see it and you can all learn from each other. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much better to have some um, interaction, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, one final comment from Nick, um, he, he wonders if a follow the sun game uh, where the teams hand off to other teammates in different time zones over a weekend would be a good idea, or if, it's, uh, if people just stay away for 24 hours. So I know that someone is designing, has begun the process of designing something like that, um, which I'm really interested to see. Um, they've said that they, what they wanted to do was have it so they have a, that it's, you have people in because they're American, uh, the people in the Britain are in the Stone Age and the people in America are in the far future and there is an interaction between those two games so they can people in the far future can send a message to the, the Stone Age people saying, oh, could you could you build, build these sorts of resources so that we have them in the future and that sort of interaction, um, which I'm interested in seeing. Um, I think that there's going to be challenges with that, but I think it's the same sort of challenges that you would have with uh, any wide area mega game. It's, so that's basically is what it is that you're doing. Uh, that just games aren't happening concurrently, and I think from what I, the the general feeling from uh, is that as a player that sort of thing is amazing, but as a control you're basically just running a normal mega game, but you have an extra, um, have an extra complexity level on top which doesn't actually provide much value. It's just a cool idea for for players. So if if someone wants to go ahead and design that, go ahead. Um, there's I think me could probably do. What was that game that ran at Shucks where people just like tagged in and out? You could probably do something there. Um, yeah, I don't know what that one was. Yeah, there was there was the one where you were all various members of the dynasties, and you um, uh, like uh, people would basically show up for a three-hour slot. They'd play their game and then they'd go off and do something else, and the next person would come in. They'd be there the next generation down. So you could probably do something like that, um, but I don't know anything about that game from the fact that I can't remember the name of it. So <laughs> I'm sure someone in the chat has probably remembered by now. Uh, not at the moment, but they might be typing, you never know. Yeah. Um, probably down to the final question now. You mentioned the Omega group, I think it was. Is this like a group of mega gamers who have got sort of technical skills that can help uh, try and um, put these things in, in on the online world? Yeah, so um, you've got me in there, you have John and Scott in there. Um, you've got a whole bunch of people who are interested in in doing it. So again, if you are interested in that, they, as I say, like building a team to help you with the port is a great idea. Um, so if you get in touch with me, I can get you in touch with with the rest of that group, and we can help a lot of people. We, not there are very there was a couple of designers in that group, but there aren't a lot of them. I think it's also going to take a while for it takes a while to design it design a game, um, as people probably can imagine, which is where where the the, the port conversation kind of comes in. It's it's slightly faster to port than it is to design. So um, I, I think that if you're if you into that, the Omega group, you've got a bunch of people who are happy to help you run the game and you've got a bunch of people who are happy and have got the experience of porting who will help you with that process as well.
Yeah, that's great. Hope these things are self-forming. Um, okay, I think that's probably call it there then. And um, that was an absolutely fantastic uh, talk. Thank you, Paddy. Um, I know that chat's been going off quite a bit, so that's that's really good. If anybody wants to continue talking to Paddy or about this subject in the uh, in the pub in Discord, please go ahead. And then our next um, our next uh, talk, well, our next panel actually will be uh, Ed Silverstone um, trying to build a mega game in an hour. So <laughs> we'll see how that one goes. But that'll be um, up next on uh, on Zoom. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Paddy. Thank you very much.